Hi all, Dr. Clark here again for forest management this lecture. We are going to talk about succession and forest regent. Okay, so we're going to go through kind of the type of succession. Succession is just basically the stage at which a forest is after a natural disaster. Okay, um, and uh, I, I I actually need to preface that. It doesn't actually have to be a natural disaster. It could be a man-made disaster where we've clear-cut a forest and we burn it, or we just clear-cut a forest for that matter. But after a major event has occurred, uh, the forest will start to return or um, progress into returning uh, into what it was when we cut it. Okay. And most often we're cutting a forest either in that intermediate species zone or area or the climax community. Okay. And we'll come back and we'll look at these in, in a second. Um, we're also going to go through the regions, the forested regions of North America. Okay. And so we're going to concentrate on North America, although when we progress, um, with some other topics. I'll talk about forest management in other areas around the world, Australia, Europe, okay, um, South America. They have uh, major issues, different issues than what we have in the United States. Um, and so they might address those issues in a different way. Okay. But we're gonna concentrate mainly on North America, uh, because it's more familiar to most people and um, most individuals taking this course, if you're going to work in a forest management field, it's probably going to be in North America. <clears throat> okay, so before we get into um, the regions and succession in general, I want to talk about two kind of concepts and these are old concepts, but they're still rev relevant today. Okay? And there's basically two models of what's the function of an ecosystem or how does an ecosystem function? And for that matter, how does succession function within those ecosystems? Okay? The first one is what we call the individualistic concept. The individualistic concept, okay, was advanced or kind of the at least the ideas i don't want to say it was created by glisson in 1917 but he's really the individual that was pushing it okay and that was that the ecosystem or the community whether that be a forest habitat a grassland habitat oceans for that matter it really doesn't matter his thought was that that region, that community, is nothing more than a aggregation of species. Okay? Now, those species interact, but one species is not more important than another, um, and they're just they're in the same place at the same time doing similar things. Okay? And uh, his idea was that it from a forestry point of view, is that let's say you have an old growth forest and it's dominated by Douglas fir. Uh, and let's say you go in and you remove the Douglas fir. Uh, you clear cut it, um, you burn the landscape. And in place of that, you plant ponderosa pine. Uh, his idea is that it, you didn't change really anything in the community. It's still the same region. Okay? You can interchange species. One's not more important than the other. So this is just the individualistic concept, okay? That it's just a bunch of individuals occupying the same place. Now, competition happens. Okay? Competition um, for space, nutrients, food, whatever it might be, it happens and that can change your landscape so maybe by removing the douglas fir douglas fir get much larger um typically much larger than ponderosa pine 
So let's say you remove the Douglas fir, right, and you replace it with ponderosa pine, which might grow faster, right, um, but not, not get as large. Well, the competition for light might decrease. Okay, so he's not saying that there's not competition. He's not saying that one species doesn't dictate what other species are going to be there, but he's saying that there's no cooperation in that system. There's no such thing as cooperation in that system. Okay, the other concept or the other model is what we call the holistic concept, holistic model. And this was put forth by Clements basically the year right around the exact same time that Glisson was putting uh, the individualistic concept, Clements was putting the holistic concept. Okay? And the idea was that these two concepts kind of compete with each other. Individualistic is based on competition. Holistic is based on cooperation. Okay? And the holistic concept is, in a nutshell, just stating that that community or that ecosystem is a super organism. And if you remove one piece, yes, the community or ecosystem might be able to survive, but it changes the system. It changes the super organism. Okay? So large disturbances, right? whether that be man-made disturbances like you know, clear cutting or, or you know, prescribed burns or, you know, new roadways, these kind of things, buildings, these kind of things, those are disturbances, but other disturbances can also happen that are not man-made, okay, but it can still change the superorganism. A volcano eruption, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, these kind of things can change it, um, and, you know, whether it's man-made, an introdu introduction of an exotic species, or not man-made, and the the introduced species just made it to that region on their own, that can also change or alter that super organism. Okay. So when we're going through and we're talking about ecosystem management or forest management, okay, I want you to think about these two concepts, these two models. Are we going to approach that ecosystem or that forest with an individualistic concept or individualistic model, or are you gonna approach that ecosystem, that, that area with a holistic concept, a holistic model? Two very different ways to manage one area. Some managers really just buy into the individualistic concept still today, even with the amount of ecology and um, food web, food chain information that we have, they still believe in the individualistic concept. And then some people um, still accept the holistic concept, e um, even with the fact that we have regions where we've had major disasters and they came back just as strong as what they were prior to the disaster. So both pieces have evidence for each other. Okay, so I'm not pushing you one way or the other. You'll see that I um, lean in my management preference, I guess. I lean a little bit more to the holistic concept. And that's mainly for a couple small reasons. And that is <clears throat> I'm a kind of evolutionary ecologist. So I know that certain plants can have certain effects on other animals, insects, and etc. cetera. Okay? And if you change that plant, that effect can be different, okay? And you can alter the, the composition of insects, okay? So ultimately, you can change the superorganism, you can make it evolve. Now, is that for better or worse? I'm not one to decide that, okay? But I, I normally approach things from the holistic concept, okay? But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that's right. Okay, and you'll see as we progress, we'll look at these different models and how it's approached. Okay, so let's look at biological succession. When I say something is biological succession, it means that it was natural. 
that the changes occurred naturally. Okay? So the disaster that um, wiped out or changed the landscape was a natural disaster. Hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes, landslides, floods, these kind of things, forest fires, whatever it might be. It's natural. Okay? And the reestablishment of higher ordered plants. And when I say higher or ordered plants, I normally what I'm talking about is longer lived plants. Okay. Uh, mainly perennials, things that don't die after a single year and that live for a very long period of time. Okay? You're replacing those long-lived plants with short-lived plants or what's sometimes called lower order plants. Um, and those lower order plants, they often get labeled weeds or grasses and, and annuals. Okay? It's not... I know like these terms higher order and lower order kind of make it seem like lower ordered organisms are not that important compared to higher order organisms, but that's not the case. Um, normally it's just dictating like how long do they live and what kind of life cycle do they have? Are they an annual? Do they die off every single year and deposit massive amounts of seeds and that grows back? Or do they live for a very long period of time, not die off, produce, you know, some seeds, but not to the number of, you know, annuals. And, you know, it might take a long time to get established as a plant. Okay, those are higher order, lower order typical annuals. <clears throat> okay. So biological succession typically means that it's natural. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that succession in general, you can't have primary and secondary succession. Okay. You can have primary, secondary se succession with non-natural or non-biological changes, okay. man-made changes, prescribed burns, okay. clear-cutting, um, you know, uh, I guess, grading of something, so tilling it up or, or something like that, large disturbances in, in a given region, um, that that can occur. Um, we typically don't call them biological because they're man-made, but they can still have the same process. Okay? So primary succession is organisms that get established in the area, okay, and they've never occurred there before. Now, when I say never occurred there before, what I mean is under the original circumstance where the higher ordered plants were on the landscape, these organisms, these primary succession organisms were not established. Okay, so they were not present. So never, never is an itchy kind of a loose term, and I really shouldn't use never, but this is the definition that most books will use. Because in regions that have a history of lots of forest fires, okay, maybe you got a five-year fire cycle. Every five years, the forest burns. Okay? Well, in some cases, those primary succession or those in organisms that aren't established at that five-year mark when the fire comes through, okay, and they come back, year one after the fire is gone okay? and then you know a couple years later they're replaced on the landscape okay? they've actually been on that landscape before and and quite frankly their seeds could be in the soil it could be deposited in the soil um, as long-term storage or you know what often happens with primary succession is the seeds of those early pioneer species, the ones that come after the disturbance, they're carried by the wind or sometimes carried by animals that are moving through the region uh, um, and, and maybe not so much established in the soil. Secondary succession um, is when a environment is only going to 
allow for certain species to occur, okay? Um, allow for only, I, and when I say natural occurring species, um, it, it depends on the region, what we're considering naturally occurring species. Again, you have to think about, especially if you think about the eastern part of the United States, where 99% of the forests were cut, okay? And then replanted or allowed for them to come back by, you know, uh, setting the land aside and just allowing for them to come back. Well, those regions might have went through primary succession and then into a secondary succession phase, okay? And now maybe with fires coming through or things like that, maybe it is only secondary succession in that region, okay? So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that you can have both primary succession and secondary succession, and um, you can have them both in the same region. Now, in places where maybe you have a routine disturbance, maybe there is no primary succession. And it's all secondary succession. It's all native, natural species that have occurred there for you know hundreds of years, and they just keep coming back every 10 years fire runs through, those species come back, their seeds are in the soil, they come back, get established, boom. Um, so primary succession, often the seeds are coming from outside of the given region. They're blown in or they travel in, sometimes they travel in by water, sometimes they travel in by animals. Okay? Secondary succession, more often than not, those seeds are coming from a seed bank within the soil. Right? And so those are kind of the two main things that distinguish between primary succession and secondary succession. Also, when we talk about primary succession, we um, will often talk about non-natives or invasive species coming in. <clears throat> secondary succession, often we're not talking about those invasive species. We're talking about species that, you know, might be dormant in the soil coming back. All right, so pioneer species. Let's, let's talk a little bit about those. I, I kind of mentioned the term, but I just want to get you in the mindset of what does it mean to be a pioneer species? A pioneer, pioneer species is the first kind of species that ex establish itself in a disturbed area. Okay? Often these are termed or, or deemed, sorry, weeds. Okay? Now, I, I ensure you that every, not every, but 90% of all plants can be determined to be a weed at some point in their life. So let's, let, for example, let's say you are a farmer and you've planted corn, right? And you have rows and rows of corn. And you're walking down your row and you see a little plant that comes up. Okay? It makes no difference what that plant is unless it's corn, it's considered a weed. So if that's a baby Douglas fir tree, if that's a baby pine tree, hey, if that's a rose bush, if that's a strawberry plant, it makes no difference. We humans determine it as a weed. Right? So the term weeds just means it's it's an it's a plant species okay, that is not, I guess, not wanted in the given region. Okay? That's that's kind of what I what I kind of would define as a weed. So again, a lot of these pioneer species, they are laid down as weeds. There's thistles, some shrubs, some inferior trees. So early pioneer trees, things that grow really fast. Typically, these are um, going to be deciduous trees that might be able to be established from nearby trees, uh, you know, through uh, 
rhizomes or roots that are going through things like aspen poplars those kind of things that might have these runners that can spring up new trees um, those are often considered inferior trees because maybe the landscape was not an aspen thicket but maybe it was you know a ponderosa pine forest after it was burnt then the aspen thicket came in right and eventually those aspen would probably be replaced by ponderosa pine, um, a more higher order tree. Okay. Softwoods, softwoods are, you know, considered, um, well, I guess, I guess the term softwood, wood and hardwood really comes from individuals that work with wood. That's why they get labeled softwood or hardwood, um, and it often is determined by kind of the growth rate of the wood or the, the growth of that tree, um, how many, how tightly uh, compacted are the, the annuli or the growth rings, okay, and then the composition, so how much tenuin, how much sap, um, these kind of things will determine kind of whether something is considered a softwood or a hardwood. The other thing that really determines it is most conifer trees, okay, most cone-bearing trees are considered softwood. Most angiosperms okay, or flower bearing trees, fruit bearing trees, okay, are considered hardwood. So the term softwood and hardwood, you know, it's it's an old term and it was really, you know, dictating kind of the composition of the wood. But I'll tell you that there are some softwoods that are extremely um, hard, I guess you could say, from a physical standpoint. They're either twisted, their annuli don't grow in, in circles. So take something like um, a juniper um, tree where they twist. That tree is very rigid and very strong and you could say hard, okay? It will dole your saw blade extremely fast, okay? By cutting into a juniper versus something, you know, that's an angiosperm, something like, you know, um, an aspen, which is really actually very, very soft um, from a woodworker's point of view, okay? So I don't want you to think of softwood, hardwood based on their physical characteristics. I want you to think of softwood means gymnial sperm. It means that they are conifer trees, mainly conifer trees. They support cones or they bear cones and majority of them okay, do not lose their leaves. Okay? So they have needles or scales, and they don't lose those needles or scales on a annual cycle. Okay? Hardwood means angiosperm, flower bearing, which bears fruit, okay? and those trees overarching, okay? not all of them, there are some examples where you have an outlier but those trees often will lose their leaves annually okay and we'll come back to the differences um, between these but it's important to know what regions of the united states and for that matter north america what regions are dominated by softwoods or gymnosperms and what regions are dominated by hardwoods or angiosperms Okay, so let's look at this secondary succession. So let's say we have a fire that breaks out in a forested habitat, okay? and it, it basically clears. It's a crown fly, fire, so it burns all the forested material, 
Um, there's nothing really living at age zero. Okay, this is after the fire's out. Um, and the plants have basically all burned up. All the living vegetation is gone. Um, so you're starting at ground zero or year zero. Pioneer species will come in. Okay, and like I said before, pioneer species it will often start with annual plants. Okay, so these are plants that are going to come in. They are going to either come in from the existing seed bank, okay, or they come in from the wind, water, animal, whoops, uh, wind, water, animal, something brings them in. Okay? Often we label them as weeds. Okay? In many cases, though, these are extremely important plants. Annuals are really important plants for the process of succession because what often happens is when you have a disturbance, a large disturbance, okay, the nutrients in this region, they also get damaged, get burned up, or um, it loses its nutrient value. In some cases, if the fire is really hot, okay, it can kind of sterilize that upper layer of the soil and it can be hard for even annuals even pioneer plants to come in and get established <clears throat> but when they do the great thing about annual plants is they grow really fast they die their nutrients go back into the soil along with their seeds and then the next year you get the same thing lots of plants lots of growth death nutrients deposited in the soil by doing that, by having that pioneer species come in, whether it's labeled a weed or not, okay, it allows for more perennial or longer lived pioneer species to come on the back end. Okay, so a few years later, okay, and the years, I don't want you to get stuck on these years, okay, so I don't want you to think, oh, annual plants only last one to two years and then it moves over to, to grasses and perennial plants. Okay? In certain regions, annual plants won't even come until year five. Okay, Depends on how bad the fire was or how bad the disturbance was. Maybe they come the first year and they last, I mean, literally they last four, five, six, seven years until you start to see some perennials come in. It really, really matters the region in which that disturbance came in. So, yes, as a rule of thumb, this is a decent chart, okay? But know your region. If you're working in the desert southwest, okay, you might have a much longer period where this landscape lays dormant, okay? Um, if you're working in the Pacific Northwest, uh, maybe the, the dormancy period is very short. Maybe the annual period is very short, and you already are in perennials at year two. It really, like I said, it really depends on the region. Okay? But grasses, perennials will come in. Grasses are still annuals. Um, okay? They'll come in. They'll get established. Most grasses are annuals. Okay? Um, they'll get established. And then those pioneer species will eventually give rise to an intermediate species. These are species that can dominate that region for the lifetime of the individual. So let's say you, uh, you know, your land burnt, okay? and um, when you were 20 and you got some annual plants coming in. By the time you're 25, 26, you start to get these um, shrubs and small pines, maybe some some you know oaks or something like that come in. Some maybe you get some aspen or some poplars or something like that to get established. Small cottonwoods, depending on the water sources, get established. Well, your landscape might sit like that with those species for the rest of your life maybe even in some cases for the rest of your children's life and their children's life eventually though 
Again, definitely dependent on what region of the country you're in. Eventually, those intermediate species will be outcompeted by the climax species. Okay? So, in the case of you know southeastern forests okay, and central eastern forests, and a little bit in kind of the the north central region, those climax communities, your pines and things like that, they're going to be replaced by mature angiosperms okay? You're, they're going to be replaced by oaks and hickory and things like that that are going to be you know much larger take up a lot more of the landscape shade out a lot more of the under storage and um, that's what's going to be established in your climax community now if we move and say hey well what about the Pacific Northwest? Well, these are not your climax community. Your oak and hickory and things like that, that's not what's going to dominate that landscape. It's going to be a different type of geniosperm. So maybe you start off with some pines in, in a thicket and then the Douglas firs or the Western hemlocks or something like that they get established or the you know the red cedars they get established they're going to outcompete those intermediate species and your climate community would be dominated by you know red cedar or douglas fir or western hemlock okay so again really determines what region you're talking about so know your region okay and then by knowing your region you're also going to know how long does it take for certain trees to be established how long will it take for something like a oak to reach a height at which it can, you know, shade out a pine tree? That will determine how long are you going to sit in intermediate species stage before you move into a climax community. All right, so briefly, we're just going to run through the different forests. Um, kind of what the dominant species are in these different regions, where they're located at. And I'll come back to this fairly often, or I might just mention these regions when I'm talking about some type of management technique. Okay, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the northern coniferous forest region. Okay, it's also known as the boreal forest or the Canadian boreal forest. All right, now that reaches into the United States, but the uh, majority of it is in kind of the cold regions of Canada. Okay? It's dominated by the evergreens, um, and it's mainly dominated by fir and spruce. But one interesting tree that comes into play is the American larch or the tamarack tree. This is a deciduous conifer. So this tree drops its needles. And so if you've seen pictures of trees, especially in the boreal forest region, where you might have you know, some different firs or spruces, and then you, you see this tree that's in the middle, and it looks like its needles, it doesn't look like, its needles are changing colors. They're going from green to kind of yellow to oranges to red. And then they drop off. That is a tamarack or the American larch. Okay. Now, the northern coniferous forest is a region where management can be very difficult because their growing season is very short. Okay, so you have very short growing season because you have a long period where the ground is frozen. Okay. And so growing season short. On top of that, it's dominated by coniferous trees. Uh, coniferous trees, when they drop needles and that kind of material, um, it makes the soil a little more acidic and also the nutrient level in in those regions is poor because you're not getting that annual 
recycling of all the leaf material. Okay, so when you're looking at coniferous forests, often the the floor of the forest is if you know if it's a real thick forest and you don't have a bunch of grasses and things like that, that for the floor of the forest is probably very nutrient poor. Which means that when you have a huge disturbance come through, it takes a very long time for plants to get reestablished re in that region. Okay, so you can see here we have, you know, most of Alaska is covered in the northern boreal forest. Almost all of Canada is. And then it dips down into kind of Idaho, Montana region um, to establish there. Okay. Northern hardwood forest. Okay, northern hardwood forest used to be dominated by the American chestnut, okay, but due to chestnut blight, um, which is a disease that came through, it really decimated the American chestnut. And so in replacement, other hardwoods came into play, like beech and maple trees, hemlock, birch, those kind of things um, came to play. We'll talk a lot more about this region because um, this is the northeastern part of the United States. And um, so any kind of forest management uh, that's done in that region is based on this northern hardwoods. And it's really based on these these trees. So this is where all those beautiful pictures of fall colors come from in Maine and things like that. Um, it's because these hardwoods, these <clears throat> trees um, are, you know, changing color, they're dropping their leaves, etc. So the nutrients in this region is much better than in the boreal forest region. Now, we'll come back to this, um, this DBH, uh, which DBH stands for diameter of breast height. Okay, so di diameter at about four and a half feet. <clears throat> I know that for some of you, four and a half feet, you know, that's not your breast. Maybe it's your belly button. Um, but, you know, for some of you, it might be over your head. But four and a half feet is basically breast height for an individual that's so six foot tall. And so that's why they call it DBH or diameter at breast height. We'll come back. I'll show you how to calculate the DBH and why it's important. But in, in the case of the northern hardwood forest, the tree is considered mature, so whether it be birch, maple, etc., when that tree's diameter at breast height is somewhere between 19 to 24 inches. And you might say, that's pretty small. Well, yeah, it is small if you're looking at, you know, old growth forests in the western part of the United States. It's true, that is small. But depending on the region, it can take a very long time for a tree to get to 19, 24 inches diameter to breast height. Okay? And um, forest managers are going to want to in a lot of regions, they're going to want to cut trees when they get to the mature size um, before they get too far past that, because then the woods, uh, uh, the, the material has a tendency, possibility of rotting. So you can get center rot and things like that. It can occur in trees that you leave on the landscape for a very long time. If you're trying to manage the forest so you can take some of the material off the forest. Okay, That's what we're talking about when we say the DBH is 19 to 24. Okay, So here you can see parts of the central United States will have uh, and will be considered um, northern hardwood, but majority of this is kind of that eastern um, east coast kind of region where uh, we get that dictation of the northern hardwoods. Okay, central broadleaf forest. This is more the central part of the United States. Okay. Um, oak is probably the most valuable and most dominant uh, 
tree in the region for central broadleaf forest. But as many of you know, some high-end trees, you know, also occur in that region. Black walnut, the wood is um, extremely valuable. Uh, the the issue often with some of the more valuable woods is uh, it takes a very long time for that material to grow. Okay, for other things that might be super fast at growing, okay, certain ashes and poplars are very fast at growing. Often these plants or these trees are used for like paper. And so um, if, you know, if you know of mills that are in the central broadleaf forest, um, sometimes, you know, they're cutting things like black walnut for very high end um, furniture pieces. They're not cutting very many. Um, they might be cutting maple, ash, poplar, even some elms um, for paper or simple lumber. Okay, um, what sometimes it's called poor man's lumber. Okay, because it's not nearly the quality that you would get off black walnut. <clears throat> okay, so like I said before, um, oak, very valuable um, as a furniture, you know, wood, black walnut, very valuable. Um, it, it really depends. Hickory can be fairly valuable in, in some regions. Um, but uh, the other component of this, um, and we kind of touched on this in the very first lectures was that the United States is really divided nearly in half. Okay? Um, half of the United States is dominated by private ownership, and that would be the eastern part of the United States. And half of the United States is dominated by public ownership or governmentally owned land and that'd be the western part of the United States. If you look at a map of how many national forests, how many national parks, how many, et cetera, is on the western part of the United States, it's it's tenfold, um, more than tenfold, higher than the eastern part of the United States. Um, but that being said, when you look at central broadleaf forests, even, um, you know, northeastern forests, uh, the hardwood forests, those are dominated by private ownership. So one year, one you know time period, maybe black walnut is really important for you know this 640 acres here. That owner is cutting black walnut, selling it to hardwood for furniture, selling it for hardwood furniture, and then a new owner comes in and just clear cuts it all, sells it all really quick, cheap as they can, and plants sunflowers or whatever they're going to plant um they they can change it to agriculture very easy because that's private ownership this happened a lot um when we you know first established the eastern part of the united states we converted a lot of force into agricultural land and um i'm you know, I'm not saying that that was a bad thing. It actually was probably what had to happen in order for uh, Europeans to get established in the United States. They, they probably needed to do that because we didn't, you can't just hunt for your food. You have to establish um, agriculture. And so we were limited in our capabilities in growing things and we knew how to grow certain things um, that we brought over from Europe and it, it took a lot more land than maybe some of the uh, agricultural things that we could have learned from the native people that were here and had already established agriculture and things like that. Um, but regardless of, of that and, and your opinion on that, um, whether we needed to cut all the hardwood forests um, or needed to cut all the forests in order to establish agriculture. What's now trending and, and has happened quite often is those old agricultural fields where um, maybe the land 
you know, it's turned over the individual who was working the land for corn or wheat or whatever they were establishing agricultural lands for. Maybe they're, you know, they're done. They're no longer in farming or whatever. A lot of that is being returned back to forested habitat. But here's the main problem. These woods take a long time to get established. And instead of planting maples and hickories and walnuts and things like that, most individuals who are turning these lands back into forested habitat, they're planting pines, long needle pines, um, these kind of things, uh, because they grow fast and you can cut them fairly soon and uh and reap the benefit of the land um you know get economic value out of that crop um, so it's a plantation so you can see <clears throat> this is part of the central united states central eastern united states <clears throat> excuse me and uh and you know it kind of it will mix in with some of those other regions like the broad broadleaf. It'll mix in with some of the hardwood regions. Um, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of agriculture goes on in this region. Um, and now a lot of pine tree plantations occur in this region. Uh, so when I showed you the early map of the United States and the, the material that's being cut off the United States, um, you can see that this region is very heavily forested um, and harvested. Southern forest, um, this is a lot of the pine plantation. A lot of the trees that, that I have listed here will be part of that pine plant plantation that's occurring in the central forest um, because they grow fast. And um, But those forests are dominated by Labaloli pine, um, Shortleaf pine, longleaf pine, slash pine, those are probably the dominant ones. And, um, and of course, um, there are some regions, private owned regions, that you'll have good stands of hickory and oak and, and even some maples in that region um, that's still, that are still established. Some also hardwoods that are very valuable. So, uh, walnuts and um, other things that are valuable, pecans and things like that that might be valuable for other reasons uh, than just the wood. Okay. <clears throat> One of the main concerns in the southern forest is uh, we've been, we as the people of the United States or people of that region, We've been cutting and clear cutting and replanting the forests so many times that the soil is now uh, very degraded. About 75% of the original topsoil that occurred in that region is now lost. Okay. Now you have to think about southern forest and that southern region. This region was excellent for crops. Uh, this region was you know, the place to grow cotton, tobacco, um, things that need a lot of nutrients, a lot of, uh, you know, can take a, a, a huge toll on the landscape. That's why those crops could, could get established in that southern region, along with the um, temperature and, and days of summer and things like that, and um, how much water they get, etc. Uh, but that original topsoil, part of it's due to agriculture, a lot of it's due to uh, poor forest management, but that original topsoil is gone. Okay? Again, you take some of these hardwoods and you remove them and you plant them with pines, with coniferous forests, then you often will take a good nutrient-rich soil and make it acidic, okay? Um, <clears throat> on top of that, you take old 
you know, cotton farms, tobacco farms, things like that, that have degraded the landscape. And because the soil is acidic, you can establish yourself a pine plantation on that uh, landscape. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a give and take relationship, um, but the soils are really uh, degraded in the region, which is fine for a lot of pine plantations, but it's not it's not fine for some of these native oaks and hickories and things like that that were once established in that region. They're, they're diminishing their populations are. Okay, so 90% of forested land in this region is privately owned. When um, a private owner manages their land, they manage their land often. Okay? I'm not saying all of them. But they manage their land from that individually individualistic point of view, okay? Because they're managing for one species, and it's their land, and most often they're after an economic value to the land, okay? You're planting lobaloli pine on your land, so later down the road you can cut them down and 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 get an economic value from that. Public land, okay, which you see in the western part of the United States, it has to be managed more in a holistic view okay, because you're not able to just manage for a single species um, because you're not cutting those trees, those forests down. You might be managing against invasive species. You might be managing against off-road vehicles driving off trail. You might be managing, um, you know, a lot of different access points. So man manage so hunters can enter, you know, people who are fishing in streams can enter, people who are bird watching, off-road vehicles, people who want to collect firewood, you know, all these different entities, you have to manage for them all. And managing your forest from an individualistic point of view, it doesn't work on public land. So here you can see those southern forests. Um, again, the central forests are going to butt right next to it. Um, the northern hardwood forests or northern broad northern hardwood forests, sorry, are going to come into that same region. Uh, the only part kind of the southeastern United States, the only part that's kind of devoid of that is the tip of Florida. And we'll get to that. That's tropical forest. Okay, the other region is in the southeastern part of the United States is the bottomland hardwood forest. Right? These are going to be part of the floodplain or the swamplands. Um, so you're going to be dominated by things that either can live in water, so cypress trees and things like that in certain regions, or you're gonna live, you're gonna have things that line flood zones, swamp regions, um, in the floodplains, so they can occur with you know water coming through, depositing massive amounts of silt and things like that, and um, those species still survive. Cottonwoods. You know, a great example of a species that needs more water and can be established in regions where its roots might be wet for a long period of time without, you know, having rot and things like that. So there are three main forest types in the bottomlands. Um, you have cottonwoods or willows. These are going to occur in the wet regions, the river bottoms, the, the banks of the rivers, the immediate flood zones. Okay? And often these are pioneer species. So you have a massive flood and it happens on the Mississippi or even parts of the Missouri, it wipes out a lot of land. Okay, Willows, cottonwoods, they'll be the first to establish themselves. You have cypress or tupeloa, trees these occur where the habitat's covered in water for the majority of the year so the roots are almost always covered in water they're um, often 
their tr the trunks of the wood of the trees will have a significant amount of water that's going up the trunk for the majority of the year. So they have um, <clears throat> these woods or these trees are very good at repelling that water and preventing that water from uh, destroying the tree itself. And then you have regions where, you know, you're outside of the stream beds or outside of the river beds, or it's an old river channel uh, where, it, you know, the water doesn't really flow there and you'll get those um, hardwood mixed for so you get those oaks and, and some cottonwoods and ash and things like that uh, coming into play. Okay, so you can see just a narrow band. This used to be a lot um, larger. I would argue that due to agri agriculture expansion in the region, the region now known as like the corn belt, sunflower belt, wheat belt, um, this region here where a lot of agriculture is now taking place removed a lot of these trees, especially the hardwoods, the mixed hardwoods that would occur in those old stream beds. Those, those have been removed. Tropical forests, okay, so the only real tropical forest that we have in the United States is the southern tip of Florida. Um, again, we talk a lot about North America, so I'll talk about Mexico, and central Mexico is dominated by tropical forests, but uh, the southern tip of Florida is tropical forest, uh, and just like when we we'll talk about kind of the desert region, tropical forests or deserts, they're, it's determined basically whether it's a tropical forest or a desert is determined by how much, um, so the amount of rainfall or the frequency of rainfall that can occur in that region. Tropical forests are, are kind of unique. You're going to get some species that occur only in that narrow kind of region in Florida. And now it would occur in, in Mexico too. But again, a lot of the regulations, laws, management techniques, and things like that, that we'll talk about, they're specific to the United States. So things like torchwood, things like gumbo limbo, um, these trees are, are very different than any other tree that you might find um, in the United States. The only place you're going to find them in Florida. So you'll see that there are regions of Florida that are set aside um, for individual species of trees. Okay, so like I said, most of these forests are protected from harvesting because there's no other place where you can find these trees. Um, but that's a whole nother management technique. Okay? And we'll talk about that protection that those trees um, need uh, because they only occur in one part, in, mo in some of them only occur in one part of the world. Okay, so you can see here your southern tip of for Florida is that, um, is that kind of uh, tropical forest region. And you can see that central Mexico um, that's going to be also part of that. But again, some of the tree types in southern tip of Florida don't occur anywhere. They don't occur in central Mexico either. And so that's why they're um, a lot of them are protected in that region. Rocky Mountain Forest, this is definitely the one that's more most familiar to the individuals that are going to be listening to this lecture um, because most of you are either students of mine or um, former students of mine or found this because you know about the western part of the United States and that's where the Rocky Mountain Forest um, comes in. This Rocky Mountain Forest are really dominated by pines. Um, there's a huge variety of pines that can occur but it's dominated by pines and then as you move down in elevation you have things like junipers and, and some types of cedars and pinions and things like that that would dominate kind of the lower lands. Um, <clears throat> like I said before, the further you move west, the more public owned land you're going to have. 
Um, so in that Rocky Mountain Forest Belt, about 76% uh, is publicly owned. So that means 76% is managed by the Forest Service or some entity of kind of government or state will manage that land. Now, when we talk about that, again, this management style is different than the eastern part of the United States. We're now managing in, because it's publicly owned, we're now managing for, for a holistic point of view, but for what we normally call multi-uses. Okay? So, not that regions in the Rocky Mountains um, don't have commercial logging. They do have commercial logging in certain regions, but it might just be a small section of the public land that's going to have commercial logging on it. And then, um, you know, that commercial logging company would move to another forest, another uh, section of the Rocky Mountain forest, and it wouldn't be commercial logging the entire region. So, you know, there's a lot of protections against cutting a large swath of publicly owned land. <clears throat> the other thing that we see is, like I said, it's multi-use. So there's large sections of the land that have been managed for other uses than just cutting it for timber or paper or whatever products you're going to get off that land um, you know some regions have watershed management we have regions where we don't want the water to run off the landscape um, too fast because rocky mountain region the rocky mountain forest uh, is established in desert regions at least that forest can feed desert regions with water. And so for the protection of watersheds, the cleaning of water, those kind of things, grazing of livestock, fish and wildlife management, outdoor recreation, a lot of things can go on in these lands um, and the management of these lands. So you can see a large section of the western part of the United States is covered by the Rocky Mountain Forest region. Okay, um, up into Canada, all the way through the United States and into Mexico. Um, and this, you know, this will range a lot of different deserts. The Great Basin Desert, okay, the Sonoran Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, they're fed by the waters that come off the mountains that this forested habitat is established. So it's very important to have trees to hold that water back. Um, and to hold that snowpack back, to allow for shade so the snow melts off slower, um, so you can have more water during the arid or dry port time periods um, of the year in this region. The Pacific Coast Forest, often called the Pacific Northwest Forest, um, although it ranges all the way down through Canada, um, but the Pacific Coast Forest is a very productive forest. Um, again, like I showed you on the map, it's not the most dominant forest, but for the small section or the small amount of land that it takes up, we do get a lot of high quality lumber and high quality uh, forest products that come off of the West Coast Forest. <clears throat> there are two distinct regions. Okay? The western region, um, so this would be the western side of a mountain range called the Cascade Mountains. Okay, the Cascade Mountains run basically through the middle of Washington State and um, Oregon and into kind of northern California. The western side of those mountains gets a lot of moisture, a lot of rain. And in fact, in the Western Washington, it's considered, um, based on the amount of rainfall, it's considered a tropical, a temperate tropical rainforest. Um, but again, 
that's due to the mountain range. The Cascades are fairly high mountain range and you get what we call the rain shadow effect. So as clouds, moisture approaches the mountains, it dumps moisture on one side and then it's dry on the other side. The Western mountains or Western Washington, Western Oregon, dominated by Douglas fir. Okay, this is where the majority of these old growth trees are going to pop in to play um, and where you can actually see old growth trees. Very large trees are in this region, the Pacific Coast Forest. This is where you can see some of the largest trees um, in the world still today. Um, part of that is because it's the farthest point from the eastern part of the United States. We ruined the eastern part of the United States, in my opinion. Okay, by cutting all the trees down, poor management. By the time we got to the western part of the United States, we had a better idea of what we've done on the eastern part. We wised up and we decided, hey, we need to protect some of the land. Um, because, you know, if you cut down a 300, 400 year old tree, it's not coming back for 300, 400 years, right? Um, so we realized very quickly that, you know, by removing that from the landscape, it could be a bad thing. The eastern part of the Pacific coast is less precipitation, far less. It's actually considered desert region. Part of the Great Basin Desert is both eastern Washington and eastern Oregon. Okay. Their production or productivity in that region is lower, um, but it's dominated by, uh, by pine species. Um, so it's a very different type of forest than the western part of the United States, or western part of the two states. Okay, so here you can see, and you know, I just kind of highlight Washington and Oregon. I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from California. California, the sequoia, the redwood forest, you know, they're part of that Pacific Coast forest and really have the largest trees in the world in that region. Um, it's just a lot of the logging that goes on in that region um, doesn't, well, it doesn't go on in that region anymore. So we don't get that much product off of those northern California forests. Oregon and Washington by far, <clears throat> all the way up the coast, Canada. Lots of logging that goes on in these regions, depending on what part of the region is dominated, Vancouver and things like that, where it's, you know, uh, Canadian land uh, and uh, the government can run that land. There's a lot of tribal land where the tribe gets to decide what happens to that land, all the way into Alaska, where we have harvesting of the um, Pacific Coast Forest in Alaska, the southern tip of Alaska. Okay, so with that, and it's kind of long-winded, I went through a lot of different regions of the United States, but it'll play a very important role as we start talking more about types of management. You might say, all right, well, that works in the Pacific Coast Forest, but that's not going to work in the Southern Forest. That's not going to work in the tropical forests of Florida. Um, so, you know, it's kind of important to approach things by knowing the different regions because you know as a manager your first job if that's what you want to go into if you want to be a forest management kind of and work for the forest service or some kind of entity along those lines you might not get to choose you might not get to choose whether you go pacific coast forest or whether you go rocky mountain forest the two management techniques types of forests are very different so the techniques are very different all right, so next time we'll talk about civil culture a little bit, and um, we'll talk about uh, some of the more specific tools to managing plantations and things like that.